Nova, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Tahir, thank you. Uh, I wanted to start by talking about your journey through poetry. Where does it all start for you? Well, I started in primary school, you know. I loved reading, I loved writing, and whenever we'd have anything to do with reading and writing, I was particularly enthusiastic about mm -hmm. it. Obviously, it was in speech contests and poetry, you know, reciting contests, and that was like fun and non not serious. And then in high school, um, I started to take it seriously because obviously I was doing a lot of my own reading outside of the curriculum. And I was very interested in like Pan-Africanism and in African politics in general. So uh, when I was 15, I think I could say that's when I started writing like seriously. Even though the stuff that I wrote back then is horrible now when mm. I look at it, like that is kind of where I began. And um, I was in an art school called the National School of the Arts in Joburg. So, um, there was a lot of art around us, you know, lots of uh, art communities, especially in places like Newtown. Um, so I would go there and I'd attend like, you know, gallery exhibitions, I'd attend uh, poetry evenings and um, uh, music, live music evenings. So all sorts of interesting art mm -hmm. was happening and I'd go uh, when I was 15 and 16. And that's like all of those influences came together to uh, lead me to a place where I was like, wow, I didn't know that people could do this just with their voices. Mm. I didn't know that all you have to do is take paper to pen and you can create something this wonderful. I'd love to try. So that's when I started ah, trying. Okay, yeah. sounds great. And wh what's your process like, like writing a poem? Hmm, different things. Um, but it, it's something, something stays with me, you know, either a line from someone else's work, whether it be a poem or a song, or an image, mm. or um, anger or emotion that has stayed with me for like a few days, and I notice that, you know, this thing, it's not, it's not leaving me, I can't shake it. Maybe it's asking to be turned into something. Maybe it's asking me to respond to it in some kind of way. And that's when usually I just sit down and I free write, you know, uh, starting with the image, starting with the line, and I free write. And once I've free written, obviously I've got like a whole mass of words and text. And then from then on, um, I start to like chip away at it until I find something. Um, sensible and coherent and worth using so my process usually starts from just like a nagging feeling okay. that like I need to respond to this somehow and then um, creatively that takes me through the process of free writing until okay. I like, get to the poem until the poem happens to itself okay yeah and uh, I love Supreme that's definitely one of my favorites mm -hmm. did that one come about in the same way no that one <laughs> <laughs> that one, that one, it's one of my favorites as well, um, simply because of what it did for me as a, as a person. Um, what happened was, I was going through a really weird breakup. Like, it was weird because it wasn't even a breakup. Um, he was, he wasn't brave enough to break up with me normally, I suppose. So, like, it was that strange in between that liminal space of like, are we broken up or are we not, what's going on? And it's like, it was a very hurtful period because the person wasn't communicating and I was confused and know what was going on. Um, and I was like, still, it was a few years ago, so I was a bit younger than I am now. Um, so, what happened? So I was listening to a lot of John Coltrane, a lot of uh, Love Supreme, mm -hmm. and obviously he's got his different chapters in that series, which I forget now for some reason, but there's Acknowledgement, Resolution, Pursuance, and another one which I forget, but it's basically four chapters, and the first chapter was Acknowledgement, you know? So like I was listening to it, and I was working through trying to acknowledge and trying to be okay with what was happening and then I just basically wrote the story of what happened with me and this person um, so that's how it came about that was the process for that but then last year sometime I actually edited it or was it two years ago I edited it dramatically oh. because I just felt like this this isn't what happened you know I was trying to tell a, a very rosy I survived this kind of story because I was very mm. uh, obsessed with having happy endings and I was like, you know what, I need to tell the truth. And the truth is, fuck that guy. So I needed to make sure that that was true to me. So I had to rewrite it. So I rewrote it. So the latest version is not the same as the one that might be on YouTube, I think. Mm. Okay. And what was it like with the piece uh, called Johannesburg? 
How did that one come about? Johannesburg, um, mm, one of my favorite rappers actually had asked me to write a short poem to one of his songs, right? Um, not Reason, another favorite rapper, he'd asked me to write a short poem to one of his songs, and I kept listening to his song, and his song is basically about like the social, economically um, marginalized people of South Africa and Johannesburg. And so I, was, I, I responded, my, my, the first lines of the poem were a response to that. And then I heard this one, one of my favorite poets, his name is KB, he's really good. He, has a, he, he had um, a poem called Joburg, Let My People Go. All right, and then one of my other poets. This is how my poems come along. Okay. Lots of different people, right? And then one of my other favorite poets, Quaz, he has a line, and he said uh, he tweeted Johannesburg, um, let my people glow. And I was like, can I borrow that? And he was like, sure. So then, all those people came together to create this, and also that also happened because I was at Carlton Center. If you go to the very top, like the fiftieth floor. Mm -hmm. They've got this really, it's like it's small and it's not the best exhibition you've ever seen, but it's a small photo exhibition, basically with photos from when Joba was still like a small mining town, you know? Um, so, like, one of the f pictures shows, I think, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, like, in its early days, um, I think they had hit, like, I think one million or something, which was a lot of money in those days, and it was, it showed, like, a class photo style kind of photograph of all of these white men, and they just made all this money, and then, juxtaposed to that, there was another image of these black men who were, like, digging in the ground, obviously with the most basic of equipment at that time, because mm -hmm. this is like 1880-something, right? Mm -hmm. And th they're there, and they look so unhappy and so miserable, you know? So just that juxtaposition of mm -hmm. these are the people who are digging the gold, and these are the people who are being enriched by it, like, that is still the Johannesburg story, sure. you know what I mean? So socioeconomic disparity is still the Johannesburg story, mm -hmm. and it still does exist across color lines, well, along color lines, I mean. So um, I just wanted to, so all of those people that I mentioned with this experience, with just living in Joburg and being like a, a flaneur in Joburg and walking the streets and smelling the streets and just understanding how different people live and exist in the city. That's what led me to write it. So it, 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 was, it was written over some years because first it was going to be, you know, for my friend's mm. rap and then I was like, no, I, I want to keep this for myself and I want to extend it. Like, I'm not, there's a lot that I'm not mm. saying here. So eventually it came to be. Okay, yeah. great stuff. Very interesting. Changing course a bit, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about your um, experience watching Love Jones for the first time. Oh, I love that movie mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> I love that movie so much, um, and I mean, by by cinematic standards, it's probably not so great. But like, that is my favorite movie because it's a love story, mm. and it celebrates black love, you know. Sure. And I love it, and um, that was one of also one of my earliest introductions to you know what we call spoken word poetry um, in that form. And like you know, uh, Darius Hall does a uh, blues for Nina. Mm. Um, and and she ends off with her poem as well, where she says, I'm looking at love, or I'm remembering love. And just their journey, and how poetry was mm. so central to their journey, was amazing, you know? And I think the first time I watched it, it was playing on one of the SABC channels, and I was too young to watch, and it was like around Christmas time. So I asked my granny if she could like, please go to bed now. I think I was like 13, <laughs> I was like, okay, I think it's time to go to bed. So she went to bed, and then I just watched it by myself, and I was just so amazed by it. So ever since then, it's been like, my favorite movie, oh, like because it's poetry and it's love, and I love poetry and I love love, so yeah. No doubt. Are films a big thing in terms of influences for you? Not so much. Mm. Um, not so much film. I mean, I'm influenced more by like music, mm. more by jazz, and but where film comes in is I just love visual representations mm. of the things I love. So I love visual representations of black people in love. Um, I love visual representations of jazz, etc. Okay. Yeah. And on the topic of influences, are there, who, who's been your big influences in terms of your art? Okay, well, I mean, the reason why I do what I do is, like, my friend, my dear friend, Lebo Mashile, she's amazing, right? So mm. before we were friends, there was a time when mm. she was just like this incredible woman mm. and she was on my screen I think every Monday or Tuesday and she was doing a program called Latitude and again like I was just like really people are doing this with words like just words like mm. how incredible so 
And also with Latitude, I feel like it was an anthropological project as well, because she'd go to all of these places in South Africa, live with people, and through and she'd document her experience through the poem that she would perform at the end of the show. But mm. while it is a travel show, she's also revealing very interesting, uh, incredible things about South Africa, about culture, about heteropatriarchy, and how it exists in the most the remotest of places in South Africa. Like, very interesting stuff. So she was one of my earliest influences, just in terms of like, like, are you doing all of this with words? Are you making me feel all of this with words? Okay. You're amazing. So that she's one of my biggest influences, Lobo Mashile. And then um, Nina Simone is mm. like one of my favorite women. And I think like she exists in almost all of my poems. There's some kind of Nina Simone reference because she is a fire. You know, she when it comes to politics, when it comes to love, like she is unapologetically fragile and vulnerable, yet strong and defiant all at the same time. She's not scared to be to, 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 to show you how much of a fire she is when it comes to her politics and her beliefs. But at the same time she sings, you know, music about being lying in the dark and being sad and hurt by a man and no matter how sad she is, she still wants him back, you know? Mm. Um, and I've been in all of those places. So I love Nina Simone, one of my biggest influences really. Um, and I love like all of the black feminist scholars are my favorite. Um, I love I love Alice Walker. I love um, I love the jazz greats, you know. I love Miles Davis. I love um, and Miles Davis simply because even when people weren't feeling what he was doing, he did his own thing. You know, I don't know if I could ever say I'm that brazen and that experimental, but he mm. gives me something to want to, you know, live up to in terms of just doing your own thing. So yeah, I love lots of the the the, the, the black women scholars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Backtracking a bit, um, could you tell us about meeting Lebo for the first time? Lebo uh, Mashila. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> meeting him for the first time. Oh my God, let me tell you. So, um, it was... Uh, okay, so I worked with Word and Sound. Word and Sound are this amazing live poetry and live music brand in South Africa. Um, and they put together some incredible stages with incredible lineups. And back in the day, when I was slamming, mm -hmm. um, I had just won Queen of the Mic like the previous month, so I had to go like defend my title the next month, and mm. it was September, and I'd just written a Love Supreme, and I was heartbroken as fuck, okay? And Lebo Mashile was gonna be, because what the format was that there'd be the, 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 the slam part of stuff, but then mm -hmm. there'd also be like one professional established poet mm. who would be like the headliner, and it was her month. Oh my God, so a p part of the, pre like, I, like, September and, and, and uh, the month before, August, were really bad months, like of 2011, were really bad because I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, uh, but I knew that I had to go defend my title in all this depression of being broken up with and being heartbroken. And I had to produce something and it was a horrible time in my life, but I produced that poem. And also another part of spurring me on to produce the poem was like, Lebo Mashile is going to be there. I'm not going to lose while Lebo Mashile is in the audience. That's not going to happen, what? So I had to work really hard. And I did, mm. you know? And like, before I went on, oh my God, I don't know if she remembers this, but like, yo. Before I went on, I'm freaking out, but then I stand up and I go to the bathroom quickly. And then on mm -hmm. my way back, she's like, are you Nova? And I was like, yeah. And then she just went on to give me the most amazing pep talk I've ever received in my life because that was the first time I was meeting Lebo Mashile. Lebo Mashile knew who I was and she was giving me these encouraging words of wisdom. I was so grateful. Oh. You know, I was so grateful and I was like, you know what, even if I lose or win, because essentially she was just like, you know, um, you losing and winning, that's not the thing. The thing mm -hmm. is you stay in control of your art, stay in control of your voice and make sure that you are serving yourself and growing in an organic way, you know, um, amongst other amazing and important things that she said, but that's the one thing, you know, I can share. Um, so then eventually I was supposed to go on stage. Mm. I was very nervous, but I went on stage and I said my poem and people loved it. And I won, you know? And like at the end, like we took a pic and I was just, that was the first time I met Lomo Mashile. I won a slam in front of my idol. Like, Sounds amazing. What? So yeah, it was great. Like, yeah. <laughs> great stuff. Um, a wish list question. Mm -hmm. So if you could meet five artists that have inspired you, that you haven't met yet, mm -hmm. 
Who would they be? Are we doing Teodoro Deod- live or alive only? Um, it's up to you. It's up to me? Okay. So Erica Badu, number one, mm-hmm. right? Like, I forgot to mention her in my influences. She's like a oh. very big in- like, But she influences me like in everything. So I love Erica Badu. If I could meet Erica Badu, if I could meet Nina Simone, if I could meet... Hmm. Erica Badu, Nina Simone, Alice Walker, um, Audrey Lord, and who else? Hmm. Probably most of Just for my feels. Okay. Or Yasin Bey, for my feels. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, just before we move on, do you have a daily routine at all? Ooh, no, I do not. Not at this point. Mm. Uh, I'm trying. Like, I even have productivity apps. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to have a daily routine, but then I do try to write every day. I try to read every day. And I just try to, like, have a little bit of meditation, gratitude time. Every day. Ah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Shifting gears a bit, could you tell us a bit about the significance of anthropology in your development? Okay. I love the discipline of anthropology. Um, I didn't always know what it was, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But I got to birds and I had these dreams of, like, doing international relations and politics. And then I chose in some of my courses, but obviously with the Bachelor of Arts, you have to choose one more course. So I was like, "Mm, anthropology, sure. So I took that. And then, interestingly, this thing that I didn't know what it was, like, I attended a few lectures and I was like... That's, that's it. That's what I've kind of been searching for forever. Like, that's exactly what I care about. That's what I know about. That's how I want to move in the world. So anthropology became, like, my favorite subject, and it became the one that I excelled in the most. And right now, I'm doing my master's in it, you know? Huh. Um, so how, how that's helped me understand the world is that, like, even anthropology has its, its its problematic, you know. It's it's anthropology is the stepchild of imperialism, as mm. it is called. Uh, it is born out of colonialism. It is born out of the need of colonial masters, um, like desire to understand the native in sure. order to properly exploit them. Yeah. That is anthropology, you know. Uh, but understanding anthropology's roots um, has made me want to write myself into the discipline, into the narrative in such a way that makes, that, that improves the conditions of my people, you know? So anthropology is the, the, was the very first exploiter of my people, so I, I need to insert myself into that space to undo some of that, you know, sure. evil. So that's the first, uh, my first connection to anthropology. Secondly, um, besides all of the evil that comes with anthropology, anthropology professes to be um, this, this, this very kumbaya discipline where people go into the field and the whole point is to understand, not to judge or to, not to judge or to um, misrepresent people, but to really try to understand other cultures, no matter how different or bizarre you may feel that they are. So with that wanting to understand other people, understand other cultures, it's given me a really um, interesting way of understanding the world, like because if you if you're gonna judge the world and judge things immediately uh, without any kind of reflection, you really do um, minimize your own kind of life experiences in the world. You know what I mean? So it's given me a very um, interesting outlook. It's it's given me a very interesting and interested outlook in the world. It makes me want to learn more and know more. And it's because of anthropology that Johannesburg came about, you yeah. know, because anthropology like anthropology starts from, you know, the visual, the observations about yeah. what's happening around you and wanting to interpret and understand that. Wanting to understand its history, why are things this way, etc. So I think a lot of my well political poems are written from a very anthropological perspective. It's very ethnographic, my process, you know. I see, I, I hear, I, I experience things, and then I document them um, in a way that asks particular questions about culture and the way we live in. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned your master's thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, could you tell us a bit more about it? Okay, well, um, I'm going to be doing my project on uh, mobile phones, youth, and sexuality. Okay. I'm very interested in especially pornography, masculinity, and sexual debuts. So, I mean, 
I, I, I think that pornography is obviously like the more that young people use cell phones, the more mm -hmm. they have access to all sorts of things, especially because, you know, your social media is linked to your search engines, which is linked to your video search engine. Everything is interconnected. So people are finding their way to really amazing information really well, but also things that they ne shouldn't necessarily be engaging in. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in young people, especially young men, right? How do young men engage with pornography? Mm -hmm. How do they engage with the gender disparities that are present in pornography? And how do they replicate those in their own lives? Because I do have an issue with hyper-masculinity. I do have an issue with the violence um, that is seemingly intrinsic to masculinity um, and also it raises questions of with the increasing you know teenage pregnancy rate among young younger women and with uh, new HIV infec infections among younger people and with uh, the, 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 the the gender violence statistics that South Africa has with all of those social ills what role does mobile phone usage play mm -hmm. and what role do does young people the understandings of gender through pornography, what, how does that affect those social ills? So I don't think that people are really asking that question, and I'm asking that question, so I'm going to research it and find out. But I, I mean, I think that there are links. And I mean, if mobile phones are this incredible tool that is bringing us closer to information, to entertainment, everything's at the tip of our fingertips, so if it is a weapon of good in our lives, uh, but it is also posing such a challenge to things like gender disquality through the things I've already mentioned, then perhaps we can start to employ the mobile phone more in order to address these concerns. Mm -hmm. So that's my whole thinking. Sounds super interesting. Yeah, I'm so excited for it. If you had five other topics that you could work on mm -hmm. with anywhere on the planet, with the budget that you wanted and all the time in the world, what would they be? Um, I'd probably do black women and tattoos because if I didn't do this one that's the one I was going to do um, because I'm a black woman I have tattoos and clearly uh, that surprises people so clearly there's something you know interesting to show on there so I'd be doing that um, I would probably look at pornography and women actually uh, especially young women, especially pedophilia, especially like how particular porn categories um, end up influencing the sexualization of young women. Like, because I see it everywhere, like in fashion and music videos. Like, so I'd be interested to like um, look at that. Um, probably, what else? Probably jazz. Uh, probably jazz and young women and South Africa because I'm, I'm always interested in like feminist perspectives of mm -hmm. things I'm always interested in like what's the gender dynamic here mm -hmm. so I'd probably look at that and lastly um, I'd probably expand my research on young black girls in hair because okay. that's the research I did for my honors uh, black girls hair discrimination and race in schools mm -hmm. and how because discrimination in a, a racial sense in terms of skin that's not necessarily allowed but it is possible to do that kind of policing that kind of discriminatory policing through hair you know and for a lot of primary school girls in South Africa that's a reality so I'd be I'd be interested because I've already done the primary research for that so I'd be interested in expanding that and seeing what kind of policy changes we could start to look at mm -hmm. from that information. Okay, yeah. great stuff. Changing course a bit, I read somewhere that Sweden has a particular significance for you. Could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, I was born in Sweden, in oh. Stockholm, in the year 1990, a very great year mm -hmm. um, <laughs> for my parents. Um, yeah, I was born there, my parents were exiles. So my parents were freedom fighters, basically, and they got exiled, obviously, and then they ended up in Sweden, okay. uh, amongst the, like a small community of other ANC members, and that's where I basically did a lot of my baby growing up, and then okay. I came back to South Africa quite early. Yeah. Okay, and have you traveled much since then? Well, I haven't been back to Sweden, which mm -hmm. is quite unfortunate, uh, but I don't, I have family there, but I haven't traveled there. Okay. Um, I've been to Switzerland, mm -hmm. but that was for some work I was doing with the United Nations, um, okay. like two years ago, so mm -hmm. I did that. And I went to Zimbabwe last year, like oh. a few months ago, cool. uh, and I did a festival there. Mm. And obviously I've been to like Swaziland, um, but there's a lot of places I still need to go to. Like if I could go to Senegal, mm. 
I'd be a happy woman. So that's like my plan. Yeah. Do you enjoy traveling? No, I do not. No? <laughs> I don't. I really don't like it. What, um, what about it? I think, I mean, oh wait, I forgot to mention, I've also been to like France and uh -huh. Amsterdam and so on. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I hate... Interestingly, I'm an anthropologist, but like I hate being in situations that are foreign to me. Mm -hmm. So like my experience of being in foreign countries, I like it's it's amazing and it's nice and it's great, but I'm sure. just like I want to go home. Like I I don't want to be here sure. in this foreign time zone with people who don't speak my language and if, you know, shit pops off, mm -hmm. I have nobody and mm -hmm. I have to die alone. You know, <laughs> no. So I have lots of strange anxieties right. about being in, in, in different places. I don't like the change mm -hmm. of time zones. Um, I don't like it being cold for no reason like it is most of the time in Europe. So I, like, I'm probably just going to spend the rest of my life in Joburg, which yeah. sucks, but <laughs> I love it here, so I'll probably just stay here. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, um, if you had to bear the terribleness of traveling and go to five other places. Um, you've already mentioned Senegal. Is, is there anywhere else you'd like to see if you did manage to travel? I probably want to go to New Orleans mm -hmm. just to experience some festivals there, right? So like, I mean, if I could go to the New Orleans Jazz Festival, for instance, that would make my life. If I could go to the Roots Picnic, which I think happens in Philadelphia, that would be like that would make me very happy. Um, <clears throat> if I could go to okay, I mentioned Senegal. Senegal would be great. Um, if I could go back to Amsterdam because it is my favorite place in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it is just really beautiful, so mm. I'd love to go back there and go to Sweden. Okay, see the hospital I was born in, just to be like, okay, I see it because people get to see the hospitals they were born in. Sure. I have it, so I'd love to see it. And um, did I mention five? I did right. I think so. I think so, yeah. Okay, great. Um, looking forward now, um, what can Nova fans look forward to in the near future? Nova fans? That's, that's <laughs> strange. <laughs> okay. Um, well, people who like my work can look forward to... I really do want to put out a book. Okay, um, but I want it to be a book of like essays and prose and poetry. Oh. Um, so I mean, I'm obviously it's really inside my studies. So like when I'm done with that, I'll probably publish. Um, so I want to do that, and I am not in the space where I enjoy performing right, right now. So I look forward to wanting to perform again one day, and I look forward to creating new work with new experiences. Um, like I have anxiety as mm. a human being, so like the, the my anxiety has been very detrimental to my creative process lately. Mm -hmm. So right now mm. I'm just about looking after myself and being happy and not putting pressure on myself, okay. and then hopefully everything will flow as it should. So yeah, I'm just looking forward to making myself happy. Okay. <laughs> really, really, yeah. And who do you have to thank for your success? Who would be the main people? The main people. Yeah. Okay. I think the main people I have to thank for my success is Word and Sound. Uh, Word and Sound is run by Tabiso Mohare and Kavazam Tembu. And it is an amazing platform. Mm. Like they saw that, you know, there are so many talented young people in South Africa, so many talented older people in South Africa who are talented when it comes to poetry, but there aren't really any avenues and the mm. Department of Arts and Culture isn't necessarily doing all that they can in order to make sure that there are these kind of platforms. And so they got together, you know, and they created Word and Sound, which I think mm. has been running for six years now. And Word and Sound has been, you know, um, overseas and, you know, around nationally and they've just been doing really incredible work in terms of bringing the talent of young people to public focus mm -hmm. so I really like I adore them I love what they're doing I really support their movement um, and those are the people that I will like name by name right but then in terms of everybody else that I have to thank it definitely has to be anyone who's ever booked me um, all the stages I've been on anyone who's ever tweeted me to tell me that their poem made their day um, or anyone who's ever uh, come to me and been like, I really love your work, you know. Um, those are the people who, I mean, it's, it's strange to deal with, I will not lie. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's weird because I'm just standing there with no makeup, you know, living my life. And mm. people, like, come through and they're like, oh, are you Nova, I love your work. So it's, it's weird to deal with. Um, and I haven't been the best at dealing with it. But I love those people. I love that you had data. 
You could have done anything with this data, sure. but you watched one of my videos, you know, or you listened to a song that I'm on. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate those people because it's because of those people mm -hmm. that, you know, we're here for this interview today because mm -hmm. I'm relevant enough to be interviewed. <laughs> um, and it's because of those people that, like, I'll be able to write my book and release it and there'll mm -hmm. be people to buy it. And there's people who care about what I think and write. And it's, it's really wonderful, you know, because sure. I am a fan of poetry. So... I, there are people who, if you tell me that this person is performing, like, I don't care what's happening, I will go there, you know, and I will buy this person's book and I'll listen to this person's mm -hmm. work. So I know what it's like to be a person who loves poetry and to have your life changed by poetry and to be able to wake up in the morning because this person wrote that poem that got mm -hmm. you out of bed or that got you to survive a particular situation. So the fact that I can, you know, in big ways and small ways, be that for other people, Mm -hmm. That is such a saving grace because people have done that for me and continue to do that for me. So to exist in this ecosystem of poetry and poetry loving and being appreciative of poetry is really fulfilling and wonderful. Sure. Yeah. Do you have favorite poems? Of other folks? Yes. I do. Mm. Um, I do. Um, oh, I love Jericho Brown. Damn it. You see, I was supposed to mention Jericho Brown a few minutes ago. I love yeah. Jericho Brown. Uh, and with Jericho Brown, like I always say, he taught me the importance of the line break, you know, because the line break is a thing in poetry, and I mm. never got it, but then he came through. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> he does amazing things with lines. So I love me some Jericho Brown, and mm. I love everything Jer Jericho Brown has ever written. Uh, so in terms of favorite poems, like mm. Jericho Brown's whole catalog. And then um, I love... Alice Walker. Mm. Alice Walker wrote, uh, did this happen to your mother? Did your sister throw up a lot? And the last lines of that poem are tattooed here, which uh -huh. I won't tell people because people need to go and find the poem and read it so it can change their lives too. Sure. So that was my, the poem there. Um, and there are other poems that I love that I've tattooed mm. on my body, but um, yeah, that one by Alice Walker is amazing. Jericho Brown is amazing. Everything Lobo Machine has ever written is amazing. Um... Else, there's um, this really amazing poem by uh, Laura Lamb Brown Lavoy, and she wrote a poem called Being Meditation. And like, I love it, like, it, it just talks about being grateful, like, just about how you plant one bean and you can reap an entire, like life supply of beans from that one bean and I just love it because it's yeah. such a metaphor for everything you know you uh, you, you reap what you sow mm. and um, sow good things in order to reap good things and it also like helps me through my whole like kind of lifestyle of trying to eat organically and stuff which is important to me like okay. you know so yeah I love that poem bean meditation so whenever like I'm like digging up spinach or digging up potatoes or digging up something with my hands and I have mm. to like be touching earthworms like I just recite bean meditation to myself just to remind myself to be like you know grateful okay yeah great stuff advice uh, do you have any advice for younger artists yes mm. I do um Stop seeking other people's approval so much. Um, I think it's okay to sit in solitude and work at your craft and not necessarily need to be like, hey, over there, I wrote this thing. Mm -hmm please listen to it, like don't badger people with your art, um, find platforms for your art, platforms that appreciate your art and want your art so for instance, if you're a poet, and I can only ever really speak for poets, right mm. like, personally I get so annoyed when people are like, hey I wrote this poem, please check it out, you know, because like I have a life with a million things happening in, in it, and I don't and I won't necessarily be in the mind state to appreciate something that you've worked so hard at, so mm. I think and this is what I did, I, I've never said hey person read this poem but what I did do is I found a platform for my poems mm. because that's what the platform de demanded and desired poems so I mm. took my poems there in a place where they could be appreciated where they could be critiqued where people could really um, you know criticize you with love you know and that's what I did and so that's how I worked at my craft that's how I got better um, I got better to the point where you know now I'm in a space where people you know, like to hear what I have going mm -hmm. on next. And it's a very privileged and amazing position to be in, and I'm grateful for it. Mm -hmm. But how I believe you should start, because the thing is that um, when it's too early and you want to put your stuff in people's face too early, I feel like you, 
it's it's not a you you put yourself in a very uh, weird space because those people aren't necessarily going to appreciate your work the way you want to, and if and that could shatter you. You know, so if I think back to the way I used to write and what I was writing at 15, if I had gone to people with bad poetry and been like, hi, I wrote this amazing poem, you have to hear it. Like, if I did that and those people gave me their honest feedback, mm. I probably wouldn't be writing today mm. because I, would, I don't think I would have gotten the best of feedback. Okay. But what I did was I kept quiet and I worked and I worked and I worked and I read widely. So I think mm. if you're going to be any kind of, in any kind of creative field, sure. you have to read wi widely. Mm. But especially if you're a poet, you have to read because there are, there's so much happening in the world with language, you know. And I, I don't believe we've even begun to scratch the surface. I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what language can do. Mm -hmm. So read widely and really make it about, like especially with poetry. Poetry is a very, um, it's a solo effort. So really bring it to yourself, bring it inside yourself, make sure what's coming out is organic and true to you, the best reflection and representation of yourself before you put it out into the world. Like you have to really protect yourself and your gift before you put yourself out into the world. Yeah. Okay. Great words. Um, and then finally, who would you say that Art Magazine should interview next? Okay. I think that Art Magazine should interview because you guys do all sorts of writing right mm. yeah i think you guys should interview the women of the feminist stock firm okay because they are all amazing writers mm -hmm. so uh, uh, by the way could you tell us a bit about it okay feminist stock Fell is an amazing collective mm -hmm. uh we're basically six um feminists mm -hmm. uh there's myself there's mili sotando bongela there's daniel paola there's lebo mashile there's Ponzo Pelani and there's Kabuli Nyali Binase and we've all come together and we are basically trying to address issues of representation of black women in South African media. Mm -hmm. And what brought us all together initially was this matter of hair. Because all of us have similar experiences, because when you have hair like mine, which mm -hmm. is just like natural uh, Afro textured hair, a very big part, as women, a very big part of our social life and social experience is going to the hair salon or getting our hair done and for, for, for women with natural hair that's like it's a very violent routine because you get there and like the, the stylists are like charging you extra because your hair is natural and your hair is difficult because that's the discourse around natural hair it's mm. difficult your hair is difficult you get charged more uh, the hairdressers are arguing about who's going to do your hair because nobody wants to do your hair uh, eventually when they do your hair they're yanking and pulling it because it's so difficult so like it's a, just a very abusive routine you mm. know and like it seems like nothing, but when you realize that other people can go to the salon and it's actually a pleasant experience, it's like, no, but why should we as black women, why should we have to uh, internalize and eventually actually be okay with the fact that you're going to go be abused and made to feel lesser than because you don't want to straighten your hair? So we're not really interested in that, like, tired natural hair versus, you know, weave kind of thing. It's just about we have natural hair, we've chosen to have natural hair, so how do we make it better for ourselves? And even those people who wish to have natural hair one day, how do we make it, how do we make them experience natural hair better? So we started having hair sorees where we would basically speak about how to maintain natural hair. Because, I mean, there's a lot of divisions among women, right? Whether it's like socioeconomic divisions or, um, you know, divisions about weaves and natural hair and so on. There's a lot of divisions, but it's like the one thing that does unite us is this is how our hair grows out of our heads, you know? So that's the one thing that can bring us together. We live in different places, we do different things, we have mm -hmm. different interests, but this is the one thing we have in common, even if, like, the shades of our skin are different. So let's unite around that. So we created these spaces, well-attended spaces, spaces that people have loved, that have grown organically with our audience. Like, it's been amazing. And the last event we did, which particularly touched my heart was one where we were concentrating on babies you know because obviously the socialization of your hair being inferior comes from when you're a baby mm -hmm. so we got like a whole lot of moms and dads together especially moms and dads who are um, different races from their children because maybe they've adopted their, ba their black babies you know we got all of them together and we had an amazing informative afternoon of speaking about how to not inflict trauma on your child uh, with regards to their hair so don't treat their hair like it's a problem don't treat their hair like it's difficult etc mm 
And we also had like an amazing like kiddies afternoon of like games and songs and arts and crafts mm, cool. with the babies. It was so amazing. So mm-hmm. that was one of my favorite sections. So basically what we do is we get together and we're like, you know, these are our concerns and hopefully these are concerns that other women share. What can we do to address them? So people can expect really amazing things from the feminist talk file this year. Um, and I'm just excited to be affiliated and to work with these mm. um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant minds. Yeah. Sounds phenomenal. Yeah. So Odd Mag should probably uh, uh, look into their right. All of the women write. All mm-hmm. of the women have columns. Or some of the women have columns. Some of the women write. I mean, Lebo Mashil is like the supreme of poetry in this country. Um, I'm such a fan girl. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, you guys should probably check in with them next. Okay. Amazing. Brilliant. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thank you for Thank your time. You. It's been great. Thank you. Cool.